Anne Miss Springs Convalescent Hospital come men and women from all parts of New Zealand to find peace and quietness. Near this pleasant spot is a large state forest containing many varieties of exotic trees. Originally established in 1901, the Hanma State Forest has a planted area covering nearly 8,000 acres. Day in, day out, through every season of the year, the Forest Service has a job of work to do. It's a vitally important job, and one which calls for physical fitness for work in every kind of weather. Small parties of maintenance men comb the forest and keep it in good order and condition. Some varieties, like these special Douglas fir, must be constantly nurtured and attended. Only by this means can tender saplings grow into strong, healthy trees. Pruning is a job for the specialist and must be done with great care. The ultimate value of the timber largely depends on this kind of maintenance work. One essential duty of the Forest Service, in which there are thorough training courses, is fire prevention. Every man is a potential firefighter who can turn his hand to an emergency. In the summer months particularly, when danger of fire is uppermost, the Forest Service is on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As trees grow, they need more space. The weaklings are chopped down to make room for the healthier trees and so provide humus to nourish young saplings which are coming on. These finished logs are from larch trees and will soon be used for telephone poles throughout the Dominion. Reaching from 60 to 75 feet in height, they are rarely cut down until they've attained the age of 40 years. Larch trees are strong and pliable and are specially grown to resist fierce weather conditions. Horses also have a part to play in the maintenance of the Hanma State Forest. Where tractors can't go, these animals prove an invaluable asset to the forester. These man-made forests are replacing native timber so ruthlessly destroyed in the past. Few are still interested in the trial of the major Japanese war criminals. The probing of the sordid story of Japanese aggression is a job that has to be done, for the world demands that in this case and in future wars, those who wage aggressive war shall be brought to justice. New Zealand does her part in the trial, and Mr Justice Northcroft sits on the bench. Another New Zealander, Brigadier Quilliam, conducts New Zealand's case for the prosecution of Tojo and his henchmen. New Zealanders also come to watch the trial and listen in on the earphones by which spectators can listen to English, Russian or Japanese versions of the proceedings. For New Zealanders have a real interest in the occupation and the RNZAF 14th Fighter Squadron is far more than a showpiece. One of the main duties of our Air Force in Japan is the constant checking over of coastal shipping in the area. An unlisted ship is reported back to base by radio. A quick message to a special unit of the 27th Battalion results in a fast motor patrol boat going out to investigate.
The New Zealanders are on the lookout for illegal immigrants, contraband, or plain black market cargoes. Often there is nothing suspicious to be found, but the constant checks are a considerable deterrent to ship owners who might be tempted into illegal sidelines. Another regular job for the army is the inspection of Japanese factories. This explosives factory is allowed to continue production of explosive of coal mines and regular inspections make sure that nothing else is made on the side. Sometimes a street is cordoned off and civilians are checked in surprise raids which aim principally at the detection of black market activities. The Japanese are fairly used to being pushed around and take these inconveniences pretty much as a matter of course. One of the things that we're on the lookout for are hidden weapons. And a former Japanese Air Force pilot who retained his revolver and then tried to sell it lands up in a New Zealand military court. The possession of firearms is regarded as a serious crime. And through an interpreter, the accused is given the equivalent of a civil trial. Some of his countrymen come along to see how Western justice works. There's a defending counsel, but there isn't much that can be said for this defendant, and he receives a stiff sentence. You have been warned repeatedly by your own authorities that you are not allowed to be in possession of arms. You choose to ignore this order, and I take a very serious view of your crime. You will be sentenced to 12 months imprisonment with hard labor. That is all. However, the bulk of the Japanese carry on their lives with little interference. With their 79 millions, they're used to inconvenience and few luxuries. They're used to working from daylight to dark to obtain enough to live on. They don't expect very much of life. In a country with a modern industrial potential, the standard of living of the bulk of the people is unbelievably low. In a country which produced all the complex machinery of modern warfare, there are millions who use the agricultural methods of ancient times. The great peasant class, tied to a life of endless toil, have little idea of the rights of man. And their submission and ignorance made them easy puppets in Japan's dream of Eastern supremacy. Today, they're still ignorant, still poor, still submissive. We can presume that they would still follow those who would lead them on fresh adventures. It's unlikely that the Japanese will change overnight from thought habits of a lifetime. It's unlikely that these people will ever really understand the four freedoms, but their children may. The Japanese peace treaty must take heed of the Japanese of tomorrow, the children who must be taught that they have a duty to the world rather than to a national creed, a duty to mankind and not to an emperor. These children who must march out from under the narrow nationalism of ancient Japan. Music